like to welcome all my colleagues here from uh, other universities and from Sydney and overseas as well. And I'd also just like to take a moment to perhaps embarrass Suri and congratulate him on the announcement of his appointment today as a special rapporteur to UN Special Rapporteur for Development. And on that note, I'd like to pass, uh, hand over to our esteemed uh, Professor Saria Deva, who's the uh, Director of Environmental. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Barry. And uh, hello, everyone. My name is Surya Dev. I'm the current director of the Center for Environmental Law. And it's a great pleasure for us to be back live. Uh, annual lecture is, is a uh, key event that we do. And because of the pandemic, we were not able to do it in person. So we are really excited that we are able to meet some of you in person. And uh, before the speakers and we uh, get going with this. I also want to mention that uh, because this is our 40th anniversary, a of exciting events will take place throughout the year. And some of these events will take place in our city campus here. And we very much uh, look forward to engaging with you going forward. So without any further ado, let me start uh, introducing the theme. The theme is climate change in courts, a responsive approach. And it's a great pleasure for me to welcome uh, the keynote speaker for this uh, talk, Professor Malcolm Langford, who is a professor of public law in the University of Oslo, and currently he's in Sydney. So he did not fly uh, from <laughs> Oslo to give this lecture uh, because we're talking about climate change. So we found him here in Sydney instead of getting him from Oslo. But of course, he is also a visiting fellow at the Gilbert and Tobin Center of Public Law at University of New South Wales in Sydney. And uh, of course, he has published extensively, and he also directs the Center on Experiential Legal Learning, whatever that means. I'm welcome. <laughs> a Center of Excellence in Education. We also have uh, a discussant, uh, is, uh, Bryn O'Brien. She is an executive director of the Australian Australian Center for Corporate Responsibility. And Bryn, uh, we have worked together on a number of different issues. And of course, she is also a lawyer, trained as a lawyer, but also I would say she is more like a climate activist. So without any further ado, I would like to start uh, inviting Professor Langford to give his remarks. And then the format is going to be, uh, Malcolm will speak for about 30 minutes or so. Then I'm going to invite Bryn to offer some comments and there should be opportunities for you to ask questions and comments. Uh, we have uh, 20 plus participants online as well. So welcome to those people as well. And of course, uh, you can ask questions and we'll take those questions as well. So Malcolm, please, you have the floor. Thanks so much, uh, Syria, and also congratulations uh, on the new appointment. Uh, it's wonderful uh, also that uh, Macquarie University has snapped you up uh, from, from, from Hong Kong. I think that's just absolutely wonderful for, for, for Australia. And um, I also like to acknowledge the Gadigal people on whose lands uh, uh, we stand today. And I, I hope and, and pray that we also see a voice uh, also uh, at the end of this year, which things are rather unstable uh, at the moment. Um, it's a real privilege to, to, to give this lecture this evening in, in the presence of so many uh, brilliant colleagues and emerging, emerging uh, scholars uh, who are working very much on this area, and I really look forward uh, to the discussion. And yes, this is largely a carbon neutral uh, uh, yeah. lecture. I took a bus and a train uh, to come here uh, this evening. In 1954, the US Supreme Court's decision in Brown versus Board of Education we go, uh, published in full in the New York Times, reverberated around the world. Yes, it took decades to implement, but its immediate and perhaps greatest impact was symbolic. It helped inspire and inflect a transnational turn to courts for progressive and libertarian causes, a field that had otherwise been dominated by conservative and moneyed interests. For example, in the USA, it immediately triggered three ways of litigation 
on equitable financing for education, given wall-to-wall -wall recognition of that right in state constitutions. In Australia, the judgment have, have featured heavily in the 1975 um, government inquiry uh, into poverty and affected a generation of, of lawyers who drew on its sociological imaginary in public interest litigation. In the global south, its echo has been heard in waves of constitutional jurisprudence in India, Colombia, South Africa, and elsewhere. Climate change is a latecomer in this sense, acknowledged only as an environmental threat in the 1980s, skepticism to litigation was initially quite strong. The solutions seemed too complex for courts, political actors were expected to respond, and human rights and tort-based arguments were often viewed as anthropomorphic, almost part of the problem rather than the solution. However, and largely in line with legal mobilization theory, the situation has changed dramatically. As the political opportunity structures, as it's called in social science, closed with insufficient action by governments and an emerging climate catastrophe, the legal opportunity structures of courts appear more attractive. The result is the so-called three waves of climate litigation based on administrative and tort law, human rights law, and commercial law, generating almost 2,000 pro-climate uh, cases in more than 40 countries and nine international tribunals. And you can see uh, the change in cases over time, starting from the early uh, 2000s with applicants ranging from young people and indigenous people to subnational governments, particularly uh, in the US, which perhaps unsurprisingly uh, dominates uh, the jurisprudential uh, picture. Only last week, there was a hearing in two of the seminal climate change cases in the European Court of Human Rights, and the General Assembly on the initiative of Vanuatu requested an advisory opinion from the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, uh, on states' obligations. And many, many other cases are pending as well. The field has its own versions of Brown versus Bro and Board of Education in a high profile trifecta of decisions from the USA, Pakistan, and the Netherlands. In Australia, where legal opportunity structures are relatively barren, the first two waves have somewhat crested in the widely discussed Gloucester and Waratah Court judgments. Yet, despite this seeming momentum, it's important to, to step back, to take the long view. Rays of light are streaming through on climate litigation, but many clouds remain. First, only half of the cases are successful in some way. You can see the breakdown uh, there and over time. With courts often ruling against applicants on procedural grounds, non-justiciability, standing, or questions of causation, effectiveness of remedies, and jurisdiction over foreign emissions and entities. In all these matters, courts are often deeply worried about their institutional competence and legitimacy. Second, the most successful cases are narrowly framed. Judgments are therefore rarely transformational in and of themselves. Their impact is contingent on their triggering broader policy actions and behavioral change. Third, climate litigation requires significant investment by parties and the judiciary, especially in understanding climate science and policy and economic modeling. So what I want to ask in this lecture is, what role should we really expect the courts on climate change? Can they maintain their integrity, their competence and legitimacy, while also playing a transformative role? And I'll argue this can be achieved through a responsive I'll begin with the three waves of litigation briefly, discuss three standard judicial approaches, and then a responsive one. So the first wave of climate litigation is quite eclectic. On one hand, it included small scale tactical litigation. Um, so in the USA, for example, environmental groups with ex-government lawyers sought to halt greenhouse gas emissions, especially from coal mines. Their tools of choice were not constitutional provisions, but zoning laws, planning laws, pollution and heritage statutes. Many cases, in particularly administrative law, were lost, 
but the aim was simply to make coal mines unprofitable. And in that, they were often quite successful. Similar strategies um, were also used elsewhere. Um, for example, in the Bennett case in the UK. On the other hand, there's been large scale uh, strategic litigation in this sort of administrative law space. In Massachusetts versus uh, the EPA uh, in the US, the Supreme Court found that greenhouse gases fit well within the Clean Air Act capacious definition of an air pollutant. On remand, the agency listed six greenhouse gases, providing more solid framework for challenging planning and approval decisions, um, including uh, new coal mines. And what we're seeing is that these sorts of challenges are now going way beyond oil, gas, and coal to a range of other sectors. In Australia, um, many of the early challenges were not so uh, uh, successful in this field, for example, in Dani. But in the Gloucester decision a few years ago, Justice Preston found, as you all know, in the Rocky Hill coal mine case, that the, rock, that the mine will be a material source of greenhouse gas emissions and contribute to climate change. Approval will not assist in achieving the rapid and deep reductions in emissions that are needed to, in limiting the increase in the global average temperature to well below two degrees above pre-industrial levels. Thirdly, the other sort of area where we've seen um, large-scale strategic cases in talking most unsuccessful in Coma versus Murphy Oil, uh, the US Court of Appeals ultimately dismissed tort based claims that the emissions of several oil companies helped facilitate Hurricane Katrina and thus damaged applicants' property for reasons of standing, justiciability, the so called political questions doctrine, as they call it in the US. Sharma in Australia, uh, last year, the full federal court rejected a claim that approval and extension to the Vicky coal mine in New South Wales violated a statutory duty of care. This was partly for reasons of the wording uh, in legislation, uh, but it was also just disability again, and the indeterminate nature of the duty as the claimant class who was being harmed with the requisite characteristics was not easily ascertained. The New Zealand High Court ruled similarly in Fonterra However, a Dutch High Court, um, and this is fascinating for me personally because I studied the Dutch courts in the early 2000s on social rights and they're amongst the most conservative in the world. And now they're the climate change heroes uh, when it comes to litigation. Um, so let's take this one, Milieu Defense uh, and Shell, relied on tort law in finding that the implicit duty of care in the civil code required that companies take responsibility for material harms. The companies uh, are target to reduce by 45% uh, 2010 levels uh, of emissions by 2030 was found to be inadequate. Cases have also relied on the public uh, trust doctrine that the government has a fiduciary obligation with respect to natural resources that it holds on trust for its citizens. Not much progress here. The US District Court left it uh, substantively open in the Juliana case. But Canadian courts have pretty much closed the door on that argument. <coughs> the second way is human rights cases, using the right to life, dignity, environmental health. Some are so called framework cases, like again, the, from the Dutch Supreme Court, again, the, la the, la the, latter case, la the last case was. So the Dutch Supreme Court found that the 2020 uh, greenhouse gas reduction target of 20% um, breached the country's positive obligations to protect the right to life and the right to private and family life in the European Convention of Human Rights. It was obligated instead to set a target of at least 25%. And then a follow-up case in Germany, in Nubel, uh, um, the Federal Constitutional Court found that the state's post-2030 targets uh, violated uh, uh, the relevant rights in the German constitution, especially given, importantly, the rights of future generations and to some extent residents in other countries. Rather groundbreaking approach to, to the issue globally. Other second wave cases concerning uh, implementation of existing policies. So one of the other in the trifecta of the three big cases is the Gary and, and Pakistan. Um, 
In that case, uh, the state was faulted for failing to implement hundreds of mitigation and adaptation actions in its climate change plan. Other cases have targeted um, uh, corporations. So in the milieu defense case, human rights also informed the tortious duty of care. Uh, here in Australia, we have the Waratah case, um, where the land court in Queensland recommended that Clive Palmer's Galilee Basin coal mine not be approved by government as would impact an array of rights uh, in the state's human rights act. However, other cases have failed. Almost all the charter-based cases in Canada have failed. But on other issues, Canada's sort of been a pioneer uh, on, 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 on civil and social rights, sexual reproductive rights. Another case, Netherlands actually failed uh, concerning um, uh, Greenpeace, where they challenged aviation sector relief uh, after uh, during COVID-19, which didn't necessarily take into account uh, carbon emissions. Um, I'm currently based in Norway, and our major uh, uh, case, um, uh, which was similar to, to the, um, the, the Waratah case uh, and Gloucester cases uh, in Australia, lost spectacularly in trying to stop new oil exploration uh, licenses. You can see the Supreme Court there. Uh, and also UK case, Magogi lost on fossil fuel dis dis uh, disinvestment based on the European Convention. The final wave of cases uh, are in the realm of commercial law um, concerning corporate disclosure obligations, fiduciary duties around climate change, as well as misleading representation, uh, greenwashing. Many cases are pending and, and the claims are very focused, but, but, they, but they potentially have great bite. Quite a few are unsuccessful. Um, uh, Lynn, Global Witness, uh, initially ACCR uh, uh, in, a, in, in its uh, uh, first case uh, relating to shareholders' right to require climate risk disclosures and plan. Um, Lynn and Peacock concerned uh, company pensions plans and the holding of coal, coal stocks. Global Witness concerned export credit support to fossil fuel companies uh, in their work overseas. However, I think it's interesting that, that many of the settled and withdrawn cases seem to have actually had concrete impacts on corporate behavior. Uh, Abraham's disclosure of climate risk to shareholders, McVeigh, disclosure of climate related risks and superannuation policies. Uh, Client Earth uh, and Belgian National Bank involved a purchase by the bank of bonds from fossil fuel companies, um, uh, which uh, was later essentially stopped by the European Central Bank actually uh, issuing the policy. Uh, and finally, uh, Client Earth. Uh, um, uh, against British Petroleum for their advertising up here, their um, possibilities everywhere advertising uh, campaign, uh, where each they challenge is contained in this uh, and the campaign was pulled. So, one could see climate change and climate change litigation as a complex problem. In the Lagari case, um, Justice uh, Ali Shah says climate change has moved the debate from a linear local environmental issue to a more complex global problem. In this context of climate change, the identity of the polluter is not clearly ascertainable and by and large falls outside the national jurisdiction. Who is to be penalized and who is to be restrained? And it's interesting reading the claims, the judgments, the claimants, the judges, the defendants are all saying this is complex. But judges are also saying we're used to complex cases in other areas. We, we need to find ways to address this issue. If we go to psychology, according to psychologists, a complex problem has four attributes. Firstly, there's a diverse array of elements going on in this problem we're trying to solve. Okay? Secondly, things are interdependent. Decision one way can affect the decision over there. Um, thirdly, the elements are dynamic. Things may be changing as you make that decision consequences of the decision. And finally, the interactions are opaque. The result is that we're confronted with so-called uh, uh, polytelic uh, problems uh, in which you have, you're trying to weigh highly different values in empirical measures, for example, environment, economy, uh, in a proportionality test, or polycentricity, where one thing may unpredictably affect another, and bounded rationality, where we have limited information. In addition, solving a complex problem often involves dealing with complex adaptive systems. 
These are systems, whether they involve traffic, finance markets, bee population, that cannot be mechanically explained. They're interdependent and adaptive. They may be highly stable or volatile, with one change triggering unpredictable consequences. In climate litigation, judges are confronted with three complex adaptive systems. The legal system. One interpretation here may have an effect over the end. The climate system, okay, with tipping points and so forth. And then we have the climate governance system. Indeed, if you read the 372 page Laura Carl Cold Judgment, has anybody read it? Okay. <laughs> About half of it deals with the likely future response of each of these systems if the coal mine proceeded or was halted. It's, it's complex. So putting this sort of social science and natural science in the legal sphere, we can understand the complex cases raising questions concerning epistemic uncertainty and a judge's competence and its legitimacy. So epistemic uncertainty arises when our grounds for knowing something are strained. So first, legal uncertainty. The relevant legal provision or precedent may be open textured or is in conflict with other legal sources, a la Hartman Walker uh, for lawyers, such that there is no clear interpretation of law. In climate law, most legal sources are inherently vague, human rights, duties of care, for due to institutions. The second is factual uncertainty. This might arise because of scientific and expert disputes, for example, over the model, modeling of coal and oil markets. What will happen? Uh, if Clive Palmer doesn't export coal to uh, uh, South Asia. Um, the effectiveness of existing mitigation, real issues for, 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 the, for, the, for the German and Canadian courts in their cases. And how do we attribute harms to emissions from one particular sector or actor in this country or another country? Then there is what I call subsumptive uh, uh, uncertainty, how a legal rule is applied to the facts. Many standards, such as reasonableness, proportionality, material harm, net benefit, are not only vague, but they require multifactorial analysis. And this is a problem of polytelic system. Different and often incommensurable things must be weighed against each other. So employment and revenue gains often on one side against loss in biodiversity, change weather patterns, rising sea levels, with their respective economic impacts unclear. And then there are questions of allocation responsibility uh, between and amongst domestic the fourth is remedial uncertainty. Courts, we expect them to provide effective remedies, but this may be challenging. And this was at the heart of the Norwegian Supreme Court's denial of a rights-based challenge to the oil exploration laws. It was worried um, that the spared emissions would only be saved 20 years ahead in time. <laughs> would that make much of an impact now? Uh, the government may have other policy options to deal uh, with reduction of uh, emissions. Likewise, courts are often quite concerned over a government's willingness to act, uh, well, uncertain, sorry, including its sequency of policy. So in the agenda decision, the Dutch government argued that it's a more ambitious 2020 targets compensated for the less demanding 2020 target. So all is good, um, at least for the government. Then we have consequential uncertainty, potential and unpredictable effects of decision. The courts are often reasonably confident about predicting second order effects in the legal system, not always, um, what an expansion of the duty of care might entail, they wrote in Sharma. However, they're often very nervous about polycentricity in other systems. In climate litigation, this concern is very common. And, and a classic example is the perfect substitution or the drug dealer defense, okay? So, you know, uh, the idea is if you take out one drug dealer and prosecute him, then, you know, uh, someone else is going to fill, fill, fill the market with, with more drugs. And so it's the same idea that if, if one state becomes more ambitious with its climate change commitments, then another state would sit back uh, uh, and, and, and relax. Or if you stop, you know, Clive Palmer's uh, coal mine, then another mine will pop up somewhere and export that high quality coal. And until recently, most courts just accept. But that's not all enough, all miserable. Um, there's a challenge of legitimacy. Um, the normatively climate litigation can often raise the so-called counter-majoritarian dilemma. If certainty cannot be found in legislation, should unelected courts impose their own meaning? Um, indeed, climate change is often a central issue in elections, it's high politics. 
an existing law might reflect the majority's wishes. Even if the court feels comfortable with the constitutional obligation, how appropriate should it be uh, moving in this space? Moreover, courts in federal systems might be nervous about treading on each other's jurisdictional toes in cross-cutting climate governance. Sociologically, courts are often worried about their actual legitimacy. Controversial, ambitious orders may go unimplemented, undermining the rule of law. The wide breadth of orders, uh, for example, covering almost all climate policy and implementation, uh, that can be found in, for example, the Rose decision, uh, in, uh, Rose case in Canada, uh, to some extent, the Juliana case uh, in the US, and courts were saying, no, we can't basically take over our, our climate policy. Um, how would we implement it if, if the government is also threatened? Of course, courts may also worry about backlash, generating counter political mobilization and interference even with the judiciary budget and appointment procedures. The experience of Roe versus and, and Rowan Wade uh, has cast a long shadow uh, uh, in this respect. So how do courts respond? They often respond in three ways. The first is formalism. Taken for granted, there's a rule of known law which covers a dispute, but, 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 if it's a case involving policy, for example, allocation of resources or the awarding of honors, you know, we gave Prince Philip or Order of Australia uh, or something, then no, that's not law, that's policy. It's declared a non-justiciable uh, uh, claim or it discloses no reasonable cause of action. Because it's presumed that there are no manageable legal standards and that the court lacks a requisite competence and legitimacy. And formalism is often skeptical to new forms of standing, especially class action. Our next approach is deference. And here it's more flexible in the procedural phase because the idea of deference is we determine which institution should be assigned a particular task and how much deference that institution's decision should get by considering the particular capacity capacities and liabilities that each institution brings to the task. So you let cases go through the just go through justice justiceability, but when you get to the merit stage, then you exert strong scrutiny. Do we really have the competence and legitimacy as a court to do this? And often with cases with great politicity and polycentricity, courts defer to the government, could should could defer to the government or use a weak standard of review like clear and irrational. And the overall vision for judges in, in this space is often incremental. They can very, very slow. The third, the yeah, soldier in the middle, is vigilance. The court should defend and enforce the fundamental principles of law. If it's in the, in the Constitution, apply it, enforce it. If it's in a human rights treaty, if it's in a statute, go for it. Vigilance holds that courts can overcome competence legitimacy concerns by using often standards. For example, expert standards, uh, state consensus, minimum and adequate thresholds, standards of non discrimination, non retrogression, non arbitrariness. We can do this as lawyers. Okay, we've got the tools. So, in the breakthrough climate change cases, especially in Netherlands, these have been central. Use of the Paris Agreement, the IPCC reports, and even earlier government policy, was, which was much more ambitious in the Netherlands. And here, the overall vision for judging is transformation. Transformative constitutionalism, as the court in common. However, vigilance also has its challenges. Overbroad remedies may go unimplemented or provoke political backlash, and the court might have to use a good chunk of its judicial capital on climate change. Um, there's often only so much space for the big courts, uh, and it depends on the system. The Chief Justice of, of Brazil's highest courts has signaled they will do this on climate change, but not all courts. Have been willing to step up. An alternative approach is responsiveness. Responsive institutions seek to balance integrity and openness. And as Drehos from uh, ANU says, maintaining integrity requires an institution to stick to its principle and defining purpose, whether that's the courts, the executive, the legislature, fourth branch institutions like human rights commissions. Openness requires an institution to pay attention to the signals from the broader environment so they can adapt to the new context faces. In other words, a responsive court will seek to walk and chew gum at the same time. Okay, It's trying to balance these different concerns. 
preserving its integrity, but also being open and adapting, seeking to build its competence and manage its legitimacy in practice. And we can think about three types of responsiveness, and they're all in the, combined in one statue there. So we have temporal responsiveness, where courts exhibit flexibility as to when decisions have to be made and create space for adaptation by the court or defendant when things change. Spatial responsibility, responsiveness, balancing the certainty of a court's existing practice with new demands, ideas, challenge, right, challenges, rights, and values. Or relational responsiveness, where one is sensitive to the parties, but also those who are not represented in the court, such as other state organs, public opinion, and future generations. Ross Dixon has argued particularly that responsive judging should be especially pro-majoritarian, alert to legislatures that don't reflect the public will on, for example, climate change. And these, see, these uh, three aspects can inflect a court's posture, process, substance, and remedies. I'll come to that. The aim here is what we can call transformative incrementalism. That may mean at times deference, mere incrementalism. It may mean at times transformation, transformative interventions and vigilance, a big call. But drawing on complexity theory, it may also be both. As, as Robertson and uh, uh, St. John say, gradual revolution through incremental changes can be the most effective available path to more far reaching lasting transformation. This is because a responsive approach provides space for actors to learn, adjust, and work cooperatively. And we have seen this open and experimental mindset in other types of complex cases. So as Cesar Rodriguez Garavito, who's also now working in the climate change space, but observed earlier, the Colombian, Colombian Constitutional Court uh, in, in 1999, its judgment on prison reform, which was detailed, comprehensive, massive, went completely unimpeded in essence. Overpopulation in prisons increased instead by 50%. But in a 2004 case concerning 6 million internally displaced persons in the armed conflict, the biggest in the world before Syria, the, the judgment covered a wide array of human rights. But what did the court do? It issued three orders. One, develop indicators. Two, increase the budget. Three, report back every year. It was a lighter touch but it created an ongoing participatory remedial process that generated significant change because every year, all the government agencies, civil society would meet around a table, agree on the plan for the next year, the judges would stamp it and off you go. Why did it work? It was relationally responsive, acknowledging the state's competence and central democratic mandate. It was spatially responsive, acknowledging the scale of the crisis, demanded judicial openness and temporally responsive, deferring decisions until they were actually uh, needed and allowing all actors to learn what worked along the way by being part of this process. So let's look at these um, four areas briefly. So posture. And one could say a lot of posture, but I'm just going to make one, one main point here about a responsive approach. And that's the idea that the court should aim to optimise the competence of all actors. Who can actually contribute to the solution, maybe itself, but it may be also state actors or corporate actors, where one is humble in the face of uncertainty, but searching for ways and methods to decrease uncertainty. And I think there's a notable example uh, here um, of Justice King in, in the Waratah Coal case, because she refused to accept the drug dealer for defense face value, uh, as did uh, Preston in, in Gloucester. Evidence was required, prove it to me. Um, and the defendants, uh, Clive Palmer's company, was pressed to show that a halt to the mining of 1.4 billion tonnes of high quality coal, amounting to 158 gigatons of carbon emissions, would be replaced by other mining companies uh, in the South Asian market. And the modelling largely indicated that necessarily would be. Uh, and so, accordingly, the judge found that the mine would uh, contribute to uh, decreasing the world's carbon budget. And drawing on new clients, uh, climate science around causation, uh, particularly uh, uh, about the effects, uh, the broad macro effects of uh, climate change on um, uh, victims throughout the world, including in Australia, but also seeing that in environmental law causation is around network effects, not just a but for, but for test. 
and also in the administrative and human rights law space, requirements for causation may be lower, then human rights may be, uh, would be impacted, and therefore the recommendation was that the mine not proceed. As to process, um, I want to note five techniques. So the first is uh, in Bryn's case, uh, which is she'll, she'll talk about, um, which concerns the accuracy of, of, of Santos's uh, climate statements. Um, an active approach is being used by the judge to try and narrow the issues to, to, to move the case uh, forward using a case management uh, approach. And if you look at some of the other cases which have failed, this might have saved them, uh, particularly the Canadian cases and some of the US cases because they were so, so broad. The one Canadian case that really has slipped through, it had just one focus, and that was Ontario's uh, uh, emission reduction uh, commitment. In the, in the Juliana oral, oral hearings, Judge Hurwitz commented to the plaintiffs, you're asking us to do a lot of new stuff, aren't you? Mm -hmm. um, and they were clearly nervous. A second thing that uh, a process-based approach, can, a responsive approach can do to process is to create spaces for negotiation. So in a recent Polish case, Client Earth challenged the use of lignite as a fuel for the production of energy at the uh, Belchertail power plant. The court directed the parties to negotiate. Can you first come up with a solution uh, here? Thirdly, courts can help increase participation by other parties. And you know, in the social rights space, there's an amazing decision by the Latvian Constitutional Court concerning pension cuts in the midst of a great recession of, of 2008, highly complex, First thing they did, invite submissions from 17 agencies and the societal actors. And we've seen also in, in the climate space, increasing flexibility and participation. So in the Neubauer uh, uh, and Germany case, applicants from Bangladesh and Nepal were granted standing by the court um, on the grounds that the positive obligations owed by the German state could extend to them and thus entail an obligation to combat climate change in the climate. Responsive approaches can also recognize the value of site visits that show engagement with local actors and provide new ways of building competence. Uh, and this happened in Waratah Coal. It's also looking like it's going to happen in a case where a Peruvian farmer is suing a German energy company and the German court is looking to travel to Peru. Not so carbon, carbon neutral, but they want to see the glacier, uh, which is uh, melting. Finally, uh, it might also be about accessing information. French courts are now actually giving NGOs access to internal company documents of, of, of corporations to see if there might be effects <laughs> uh, uh, using a fascinating use of signal. Substantively, um, responsive approaches tend to favor standards over you. <laughs> in complex policy and practice environments, Braithwaite found empirically that general standards backed by monitoring are more effective than detailed rules and regulations. And a good example in both social rights and climate change is the German constitution. It refuses to determine precise outcomes. It often finds a, you know, a social security benefit or a carbon emission target is unreasonable, it's inadequate, and it gives uh, the government time to sort it out and often report back, what did you do? And what happens? It, it, it respects the government's competence and democratic role, but it creates space for civil society to come in. And what we see is you often get more from that process, way more than what the court actually asked for. And this happened in, in the Nubauer uh, case where the claim, um, the claim was unsuccessful formally in getting a finding that the 55% reduction target by 2030 was, was sufficient when it should have been 70% on the Paris. But the court found, well, the post-2030 targets are inadequate because they fail future generations. What happened in that negotiation process afterwards? The, court, uh, the government went way beyond uh, the decision and even actually improved its 2030 targets. Secondly, um, complex systems often have sustainability thresholds, certain limits and boundaries at which we can understand and intervene without causing great volatility or negative feedback. In law, we can use minimums, available resources, discretion, doctrines. It's interesting the Uganda decision because on one step, on hand, it looks like a vigilance decision, a big step jurisprudentially, a precise rule, 20 to 25 percent mm -hmm. in the state's carbon reduction, uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction target. But it's actually not a very large increase. The Netherlands were prepared to take it. What it did was a set, set a precedent and it's impacting policy processes in the Netherlands. 
Finally, there are remedies. And it's here I think there's a lot more space for, for innovation in climate change litigation. Because responsive remedial approaches work especially well when actors agree on the end, addressing climate change, or disagree on the means, the how. And some of the main techniques are responsive deferral, as we've seen in the German case. Give the state, state some time and space to develop a remedy first, but follow them up. Rolling regimes of report back, as we saw in the Colombian IDP case, which went on for relatively long. Or blackjacking. And this is what US, German, and Indian courts have sometimes done. Is they basically write a detailed, almost uh, piece of legislation, but the state can come back if they've got a better idea, and then the court will change it. Courts have also engaged in institutional innovation to navigate high levels of complexity. So in the, in the, in the Pakistan case, uh, they set up a climate change commission to monitor implementation of the government's policies. They had key ministries, NGOs, and technical experts represented. And in 2018, the justice dissolved the commission on the basis of being improved progress, and there's now a standing committee. Conclusion. Climate change is a hard case uh, for courts. Um, on one hand, morally, it's perhaps the issue of our time. On the other hand, it requires courts to confront complexity and the limits of their competence and legitimacy. So in this respect, both vigilance and deferential reflexes are understandable. But I've tried to argue that a responsive approach might be preferable, particularly for many of the newer jurisdictions uh, coming into the space, and therefore focused on transformative incrementalism. And this might be, and this, you know, can give us, you know, at least four types of things. It can create space for the testing of factual claims and policies, providing space for organizations to get publicity, but also contact with decision makers. Um, secondly, focused uh, but strong claims uh, can be particularly uh, useful. I think climate risk disclosure is interesting in the types of, of broader effects it can trigger. Thirdly, you can have broader but weaker claims, okay, requiring an actor to revisit a climate target or its policy. And fourthly, and, and I think this is, this is what we've seen in other areas of, of rights litigation over the last 70 years, that courts can justify being stricter over time as it's clear that not very much has happened. Um, and that's why I think that, you know, it, one could almost set up courts for this sort of uh, uh, process, because well, I suspect what's going to happen is in 2026, there's going to be a massive rush of cases because the carbon budget is going to be declining dramatically. And so for courts to say, well, we're going to give you, you know, a little bit of time, okay, you failed. And, and, and a number of courts around the world have said this, okay, we've given you 10 years, now we move. But that requires a, a, a logic. So I hope that this gives uh, some insight into what uh, an alternative fourth approach might be to, to climate change litigation, allowing courts to play a role, uh, uh, but with integrity. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Malcolm, for walking us through the different waves of litigation, different approaches, and proposing your own, own approach, uh, the responsive approach, and uh, how this might be a better way forward for the courts. Thank you for articulating that. Now I'd like to invite Bryn uh, for her observations and comments, and also connect uh, the theory and, and the academia to the practice side of it. So what is happening in, in the reality in society and how you're trying to engage also investors and companies. So Brent, you have the floor now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you um, so much, Surya, for the invitation and congratulations as well. I will take the opportunity to embarrass you again. Um, <laughs> congratulations. And, and thank you and congratulations to Malcolm on, on that lecture. It's a real treat for um, me to be here. I spend most of my time talking to investors rather than sort of nerdy people listening to law lectures on a Wednesday night. I suspect you might enjoy more what I have to say than, than yes. institutional investors do. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge country, um, to acknowledge uh, the ongoing custodianship of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, this beautiful place in which we, we meet and, and pay my respects. I, and I want to acknowledge First Nations leadership in responding to the climate crisis. Um, it is no accident that um, uh, colonisation, well, like, probably the wrong way of framing it. What I, what I mean to say is that colonisation extracts its capitalism 
um, and climate change uh, inextricably interrelated. And, and uh, First Nations people in Australia and around the world have been at, at the forefront of, of many of the cases that, that Malcolm uh, has mentioned, including, you know, of course, the Waratah coal case. Um, so I, I'm going to give you a, a, a before I jump in, I've been scrambling to sort of arrange my thoughts. This is, it really is the best gig um, because you get to listen to a fascinating lecture and just kind of jot down ideas as, as you're going in. And, but then you have to stand up and, and try to make sense of them um, and your terrible handwriting. Um, but but to, I, would, I want to, Surya remarked at, um, at the start that, that I was more on the climate activist side and, and that's right. Um, but I occupy a very, very unusual and, and, and very legal um, part of the, the climate activist sphere. So I'm a trained lawyer, but I do not practice. I am now a, a litigant, as Malcolm has alluded to. So ACCR is an Australian not-for-profit organisation that acts as though, uh, it, it acts like we think major institutional investors who are trying to confront the systemic risk posed by climate change should act. So we invest, we have small positions in major listed corporations in this market, in the Japanese market and in European markets. And we use uh, the rights afforded to shareholders through that ownership of those shares to engage with companies and to use the formal tools of engagement. So filing and co-filing shareholder resolutions, initiating legal strategy um, uh, where shareholders have rights to do so, um, uh, nominating and um, uh, campaigning for the removal of directors and so on. So it, it's very, very legally focused climate activism, but it also uses some very orthodox tools, corporations law, trade practices law. Um, we are now in the, in the torts and human rights space. Um, so ACCR is an un unusual activist. But with that, um, I, I, I'd like to um, also uh, position us in the scientific context and um, and I'm just going to read to you a few statements um, from the recently published I, uh, IPCC synthesis report. A bunch of very conservative scientists or you know negotiating with governments about the statements they can make about uh, climate change. And what they do is they pose a statement and then they give a level of confidence. So just to situate this in the I guess temporal and scientific context. Climate change is a threat to human well-being and planetary health very high confidence. There is a rapidly closing window of opportunity to secure a livable and sustainable future for all. Very high confidence. So this group of conservative scientists is out there saying there is a rapidly closing window of opportunity to secure a livable planet, right? That's where we are. That's the historical context. That is the scientific context. That is the moment that we're in. I'm going to come back to that because I, I think this time urgency is really, really important in this conversation. Um, the choices, this is the last one I'll read, but the choices and actions implemented in this decade will have impacts now and for thousands of years. High confidence. So this is the moment we're in. That's the crucial context. Our mission, ACCR's mission, across the companies that we invest in, is to see changes to their corporate strategy to re reduce real-world absolute emissions in line with science. Currently, our universe covers about six gigatons of emissions per year, that's about 14% of our global energy system emissions. Emissions across that universe are going up. It's 2023. So I'd like to, to just cover kind of three aspects of, of, of Malcolm's talk. Um, and, and again, very much um, situated in, uh, not at all in a, a theoretical or juridical um, context, but, but a practical context. Um, two things that I think uh, are noteworthy that might be determinative um, of, of, you know, the effectiveness of legal strategies and, and of um, judicial interventions in the climate crisis. Um, I will come to the Santos case. Um, and, then I, and I'd like to make some predictions, perhaps not about legal strategies, but about the targets of them um, going forward. So um, the first, um, the first uh, determinative factor that I'd like to mention is just the way that that courts approach these hard limits that we have. And there are two. One I've mentioned, which is time. We're out of it. Um, and we have really, if we're talking about corporations and the decisions that they need to make and judicial oversight of what, you know, what, what corporations are doing and, 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 and how it aligns with the law, um, the decisions that need to, be made, need, need to be made by the boards that are in the chairs today 
not the boards that are in the chairs in 10 years' time. These decisions, these are big ships to turn around. So these decisions have to be made for the board by the boards of today. The other constraint, the, the, the rational and, and major constraint is a carbon budget. And, and, and I think we have some reason to be hopeful from, from Malcolm's lecture that courts are starting to deal with the carbon budget. Um, but I'd love it if you could address that. You know, that last remark that, that you made about, well, courts have, have sort of said, well, you've got a bit of time and, you know, you, but 2026 is coming around and, and you might not have any left. How do you think courts might approach that moment and why? Um, but I think the sensitivity of, of courts to these two problems is absolutely crucial to the effect, their effectiveness. Um, and they will be determinative of the success of legal strategies, not in a kind of case-by-case -case basis, but in the success of the effectiveness and the ability of legal strategies to confront um, the collapsing livability of, of our planet. Um, the second is... Um, I don't have so much evidence to, to, to be concerned about this, but, but I'll say it anyway. Um, the second is court's ability to enforce judgments in a hard, in a hard way, in, in an atmosphere of, of, as you say, um, many different dimensions of uncertainty. So I'll give you an example. The Milieu Defensee case, the 2021 uh, case, torts and human rights case in the Netherlands, um, found not only that Shell's targets were inadequate, but that what Shell needed to do to have an adequate target was to get to a, um, I think it's a 45% reduction in its absolute emissions, so including its scope three emissions, emissions from the products themselves by 2030. Um, our research, ACCR's research, demonstrates that Shell intends to increase its absolute emissions footprint by at least 4% by 2030. That is a major enforcement gap. That's a 49% enforcement gap. So um, that, is a, that is of concern. Coming to my reflections of the Santos case, um, I really enjoyed that. It's a, a delight for, um, for, for, for me and for ACCR to see, to see it discussed in, in this kind of a forum. Um, this is a modest case. Um, it is a solid case, of course, in our view, but it is a mo modest case under orthodox law. Um, the relief sort is simply a declaration of statements, um, a set of statements we identify that have been made by Santos and um, senior executives, in, including its, um, its CEO, and, and signed off in some cases by the board. A, direct, that a declaration from the court that some of those statements are misleading and or deceptive under the Corporations Act and relevant consumer law, and that they constitute that, a contravention of those parts of the law. That's all we're seeking, right? Modest case, orthodox law. Um, and I'd be fascinated in, in how, you, how you classify it because um, I do think um, the case management approach that, that you, I, um, you spoke about, so uh, uh, that Justice Michael Lee in the federal court was recently appointed to this case and, and has taken quite a, a hands-on approach to case management. And um, I do think that that, um, is, is an attempt, uh, conscious or not, but to manage those limits around competence and legitimacy of the courts. So it, it is a really, the, 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 the interventions today have been to um, try to force the parties together to agree on some facts, because what we're talking about in large part is, is uh, factual matters. So, um, you know, I think that that is it's very interesting. We, we don't yet have a, a hearing date, um, but we, um, so in a traditional context, so it's a, a world first case challenging the, the veracity against corporations, consumer law and companies claims to have a, a, a credible path to net zero. Um, so, so finally, um, I think that in, in the next, Next wave, I think we're going to see um, three kinds of, of, of targets. Um, and this is, I don't want anyone to get the wrong impression that ACCR has active legal strategy against any of these targets. This is just me uh, thinking, you know, in, in response to your questions about some of the, I guess, vulnerabilities that, that we see out there in the market um, on a daily basis. Um, 
One is interesting. We, we, we started to see Australian regulators um, look into to greenwashing. And we start to see um, some of the actors that have kind of in some ways been at the forefront of declaring that climate change is real, that it's material, that it is needs to be managed, like superannuation funds, be targeted uh, by, um, by the regulator for the statements that they're making about the effectiveness of, of their strategies and, and their portfolio composition. Um, so I do think we are, I'm less interested in, in that. I mean, I of course think that, that funds should be um, disclosing um, accurately, making accurate representations to their members. But I'm interested in where the law goes to. You know, there's obsession with disclosure at the moment. Um, I think where it needs to go to is um, to an obsession with the management of, of systemic risk. Um, so capital markets, of course, uh, rely on um, financial, um, uh, environmental uh, and social systems to exist and uh, investors' ability to make absolute financial returns relies on the predictability to an extent of capital markets over, over a long term. Um, and capital markets and, and, and the, the systems that support them are at risk from runaway climate change. So the only way of mitigating systemic risk is to prevent emissions from being emitted. That's the only way, right? And really, at scale, that's it. Um, but there are, and there are two ways that investors can do that. Um, one is engagement with governments and um, uh, talking about policies, getting the right policy settings in place. And the other is stewardship of companies and their portfolios. So um, that is having conversations and using shareholder rights to um, uh, decrease real world emissions. So we're, we're starting, we're, we're in a position where investors by and large are considering a kind of fiduciary possibility of system stewardship, a fiduciary possibility of looking at risk across a portfolio and deploying strategies to manage that risk. But where we need to be, there is, there is a fiduciary compulsion, fiduciary responsibility to manage systems risk. And I wonder if that's where the law will go to next, and, 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 I, and I hope so. Um, uh, the other, which is also already underway, is um, Directors uh, Judy says Client Earth uh, case, uh, Client Earth is a derivative action commenced um, against uh, Shell directors personally, procedurally very difficult to run um, uh, in, in not just my view, in the view of many litigators, but um, uh, fascinating and whether it's directors' duties or directors' elections, boards are accountable for the oversight and management of climate risk, and where they have consistently failed to do that, they uh, they uh, should and must be held to account. Um, finally, um, I, I think that we will see more litigation on um, speculative capitalist and techno fixes. Um, so I would include. Um, many types of offsetting, in fact, most types of offsetting in that. Um, Woodside, Australia's largest listed oil and gas company, plans to um, offset more than 100% of the emissions that it has said it's going to reduce. Um, uh, various different types, depending on the, um, uh, the industry of, of, um, of technological fixes, carbon capture and storage, direct air capture, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and the ability of these um, technologies to scale in time and to have an impact on the carbon budget. So I am, I am going to leave it there. Um, I, I thought my final thought is just, it was an absolute um, thrill for, for me to see so many of my lawyer friends around the world represented in that <laughs> um, slide deck. So um, most of this work, most of this litigation work around the world is done by non-profit organisations, client earth, non-profit organisation, the Environmental Defenders Office, non-profit organisation, equity generation lawyers, agenda, and on the other side is all the big programs, right? That's still where we are. That is still where we are. It's 2023. Um, I will leave it there. Thank you very much. All right. So thank you very much, Bryn, for raising a number of questions. And if I could add one more question before we open the floor. 
Uh, so I was with Sajar, uh, and uh, the title of his book is uh, Litigating the Climate Emergency. My question to Sajar was, do we litigate when it is emergency? Is it effective? Because courts are very slow, reactive, and they don't do much if it is an emergency. If your house is burning, don't go to the court, seek an injunction. You do something different. So I mean, that was my question to him. Probably I'm going to add that question to you as well. Uh, but I would like to now open the floor for uh, any questions and comments and uh, people who are joining us online. Thank you very much for staying uh, with us. Uh, you can also ask questions. Uh, either you can put your question in the Q&A or you should be able to uh, also unmute now. Yeah, I think we can unmute you as well. So if you if you would like to, so please let us know if you want to raise the question, but uh, I'm going to pass on the microphone so that people can. So can I see the hands in the room, uh, the questions? Okay, so let's start here. Can I see more people raising hands so that, that I have a sense of uh, who is, okay, but at least we can start with Peter. Okay, and then we go to the next gentleman there. Yes, please. If you can identify briefly yourself and then ask a question, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, my name is Peter Korn. Um, for many years, I was leading a practice in China, and the main focus was trying to deploy clean technologies to clean tech, uh, China up. So, of course, that's a very, uh, it's just representative of what lots of different people are trying to do throughout the world. And I think the biggest obstacle we had was the economics, the economics of attracting investing, investment to scale up all of these solutions. Because basically, um, what we find, and, you know, China's no different from anywhere else, is, you know, the overall subsidization of um, industries that basically persist in emitting carbon to a much greater extent than they could be doing because the technologies are there. It's just that they're not economic. So I was interested, Thomas, in what you said about uh, so far the public you know, litigation, the public trust litigation hasn't got any traction, right? So I was thinking, you know, we really need a big hit, something akin to like the Minamata Bureau litigation in environmental law in Japan that, changes the whole landscape completely right away. So I was wondering, how can we do that in order to really oblige governments to get rid of these damn subsidies? Thank you for that question. Uh, if you can pass on the microphone, we'll collect some questions and then get back to the speakers. Uh, both of them can then respond collectively. Thank you. Um, and thanks very much, Malcolm and Bryn, for um, very thought-provoking presentations. Um, so my question's about- um, If you can identify- Sorry, I'll be your partner. Sorry, yeah, Tom Morton, I'm a journalist, a uh, former academic. Um, and um, my question's really about the potential for loss and damage or injury litigation against fossil fuel companies. Um, and I might just preface it by reading something out to you. Um, it's a quote, the conventional and probably conservative wisdom is that global mean temperature will rise between 0.5 and 1.5 degrees centigrade in the next 30 years. Pretty uncontroversial, except that it's a quote from a, a confidential internal shell document from 1989. Now, we know that there's been litigation um, against ExxonMobil in the United States, but I wonder now what is the potential for um, the kinds of claims, for example, were made against tobacco companies, against the asbestos industry in Australia, um, about knowledge that they knowingly withheld um, about the, uh, the potentially uh, dangerous or damaging effects of uh, their products in contributing to climate change. All right, thank you very much. Uh, okay, let's take one more question this side, and then uh, then we'll give this space to the speakers. Thank you, um, I'm Nathan. I'm from a company that was featured in the presentation. So to see our company up in lights. Um, just to follow that up, I, I just wanted, um, 
curious about both your views in terms of individuals facing disastrous consequences within the Australian context associated with climate risk. So, um, you know, governments have zoned and planned, banks have lent, insurers have insured. Suddenly, insurers are saying, we're not insuring you. Banks are working out what to do. Governments are doing very little. So just really curious about your views on, on that space. Thank you very much. Uh, so we'll start with Malcolm and then probably Brent. We can also reflect if you would like to. Uh, and then we'll take second round of questions. So Malcolm, start with you. Thanks. Yeah, so there, there was a lot there, so I'll try and be uh, quite brief. Um, so the, the point on the carbon budget that, that, that Brent made, I think the fact that now we have this sort of clear mathematical concept of, of, of the carbon budget, because of the Paris Agreement, we're able to increasingly kind of calculate countries. Um, uh, you know, commitments that, that would then equate to, into that budget, or we are able now to say what Shell, you know, would contribute uh, to, to that budget, I think is, is a game changer when you read the German and Dutch cases, it's, and, and also the Waratah Coal case as well, because suddenly it, it gives, it's giving judges a lot more, more, more certainty. So I think it's, moment, that's probably what the, one of the big things that Paris Agreement has really given us. Um, and in some countries, it's been constitutionalized, like in Germany, essentially, through, through these cases. So I think that gives, gives some hope. But then on the other side, you say, yeah, enforcement uh, is a challenge. And having worked a lot in also strategic litigation, you know, there's, there's a real danger that one reifies and, and falls in love with courts. Uh, if, if one thinks that courts are going to do everything for you on the ground. Uh, and that's why responsiveness can trigger that thought is actually there's probably a lot of other actors who need to make this judgment actually work and so um, one of the first jobs I ever had when I was working for an NGO in 2003 was to go around the world interviewing lawyers about their social rights judgments and then what happened afterwards and most couldn't tell me because they hadn't engaged with social movements during the litigation those movements weren't there for, for the implementation uh, 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 phase and so it's an from a litigation strategy perspective it's absolutely key that one thinks about enforcement from day one and maybe the case is not about enforcement okay we're never going to get shell to implement that but we're going to use it for pressure we're going to use it for precedent we, we know what we're going to use it for how can we do that strategically? And so there's one, so a little worry about me about the wave of climate change lawsuits. It's a sort of buckshot, you know, just firing everywhere. And is there enough um, civil society power behind it? 70% of the cases are filed by environmental uh, organisations and Indigenous people's organisations. I think on, on the narrowing of the claims point, I think it's, you make a really, really good point. So about not only about competence and legitimacy, but it's about time. Because if we, you know, 2030 is coming, these big cases take around five to 10 years, particularly in the common countries. They go faster in, the, in, in Europe, way faster. So, you know, focus claims, you might be able to get a judgment in a year or two years, or three years, which then you can use, you know, to politically to have a legal precedent and so forth. So I think this, this time thing is uh, really important. Um, just in terms of the, uh, the public trust doctrine um, it was around subsidies. Um, yeah, so that's it's a little bit easier in, in, the, in the European Union context, but there's a whole lot of regulations around subsidies, uh, but not, not else. I'm not sure if Bryn has thought so much about that, but there may be different ways um, uh, that, that we could discuss. On loss and damages, I think it's a really good, uh, it's fascinating comparison with the tobacco companies. Um, so, which might give one hope. On the other, and what the judgments are saying is that when it comes to court law, you have this backward looking causation approach. So you've got to show that these particular acts mm -hmm. led to these particular harms, and then you've got contributory negligence. So it's, it's hard in a traditional tort space. It's much easier in a human rights uh, 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 space uh, or administrative law in terms of approvals. Um, so I think it would require some legislative uh, uh, change or um, some quantification that if you had some sort of class action um, and, and actually said, okay, Shell, you contributed 1% to global, I don't know how much they, you know, and here are all the victims in a US court, you know, which does extraterritorial jurisdiction to a certain extent, Supreme Court's clamped down, possibly. Um, so I think I'll leave my comments. Just the other thing I didn't talk about, I think it's something to be important 
given we're talking about climate mitigation in general, is there's also the dark side. So in the last five years, there's been a rising number of cases challenging pro climate policy. Um, so going back to the, you know, the, uh, the 1890s with the challenges to the US welfare state. So you know, corporate actors, um, right-wing parties and others are challenging um, uh, climate policies. And that's something to be aware of. There's also the just transition cases. You know, we're saying, okay, no, we don't want this windmill violates indigenous people's rights, like the big case we have in Norway, but it took look at the visit us. You know, so there's, there's a range of other types of litigation going on uh, as well, but just a, just a Thanks, Malcolm, and thanks for the questions. On the subsidies point, um, I didn't have a problem with subsidies um, for new industries. I have a problem with subsidies for fossil fuels incumbency to protect fossil fuels incumbency. Um, I don't know that that is a, a question that can be addressed by litigation. It's, it really is a core political question. Why are governments um, paying uh, fossil fuels companies and developers to stand up uneconomic projects? It just makes no sense. Of course, it's, it's not only uh, happening in Australia, it's, it's happening at a massive scale in, in the UK where there's a, 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 a case at the moment where, um, uh, not a legal case, but um, the UK government is, is going to subsidise uh, Equinor, not Norway's super major oil company, to expand into a massive field in the North Sea that would otherwise be uneconomic. Well, people can't, you know, they, they, people are choosing literally between heating and eating, right, or, or, or did over the last winter. So that um, that is, it's crazy and it needs to stop and it should, it, we should not be doing it, but we are subsidising fossil fuels companies to the tune of, you know, billions and billions of dollars per year in Australia. Um, uh, loss and damage um, uh, litigation, Tom, um, I don't know, but investors are starting to ask this question. So there is a shareholder resolution that I believe will go to Exxon's AGM this year, filed um, uh, by um, some, a non-profit uh, organisation, sort of similar, um, or a, a, a director of a non-profit organisation similar to ACCR. It's called, as you so, in the United States, and it asks Exxon for an actuarial assessment of potential exposure to litigation liability. Um, as to whether shareholders will support that, um, I don't know, um, but, but they should, right? So that I think is really an interesting development. Um, individuals facing disastrous consequences. Um, you know, I, I, I again think this, this is um, an area for massive regulatory uh, and government intervention. Um, there's no way around it. Um, it, it. You know, the people in Lismore are in absolutely, you know, desperate situations. The people on the south coast who are still waiting to rebuild their homes after the, you know, 2020 bushfires. Um, yeah, I, I don't know that um, litigation is a way to achieve justice for, for those people. All right, so you might have time for one or two more questions, maybe from this side of the room. Uh, so let's take a few more questions. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. So we're fascinating. I'm Anna Talbot. I'm doing a PhD at UNSW um, on climate change litigation. Um, and I was just wondering what your views are on um, all of the international courts involvement in um, this area. There's it lost is doing, there's a lot of advisory opinions. It lost Inter American Court, ICJ, just as of earlier this week or last week. Um, the UN treaty bodies are all seeming to get involved. The special procedures are doing some pretty powerful reports as well. So I'm just interested how you see that feeding into some of this domestic litigation or how you anticipate it might feed into the domestic litigation in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Arif. I work as a session academic at Macaulay Law School. I teach and research ocean governance and the law of the seas. So my question was pretty much asked by my previous uh, speaker. So uh, basically, you uh, fantastically analyzed the domestic litigation scenario, but I was curious about what's happening in the international judicial fora. And uh, we know that advisory opinion will come up in the clause one and the second one in ICJ. How much can we expect from these litigations and given that they're advisory opinions? Thank you. All right, uh, Annie, 
for the questions in that corner because oh okay Eastern, yeah okay <laughs> yeah so that would be the last one I do okay. thank you I have a quick question but I also have a comment um I'm from the Netherlands and you know what happened today the next big council of state decision which unfortunately was not the one um by the um organizations that try to challenge the government on a 25 uh, kilometer range um, for nitrogen deposition. Um, the, the Council of State, the, the decision came out an hour ago, <laughs> um, which is why I was on my phone. Um, the Council of State did say, um, well, the government has a general responsibility, but this case is not about the general responsibility, so we can't deal with it. So I think they're moving from vigilance to formalism now. Um, <laughs> my question is, um, so you mentioned um, earlier on about um, the civil law countries being a bit more quicker than the common law countries, and you noted that there was um, 50, um, I think 54% of cases that were won and the other ones weren't. And I'm curious to know if there's a big difference between, for example, success rates in civil law countries versus success rates in common law countries, if you have that disaggregated date. Thank you. All right. So um, maybe we will give the last words. Should we start with Brent this time? Oh, um, okay. Uh, international law. So, um, uh, I, I think, um, I mean, the, the, this is really interesting stuff. The advisory opinions um, are um, fascinating, but it's a kind of bizarre old world out there because you've got countries like Australia kind of joining this request for an advisory opinion and green lighting, you know, gigatons of fossil fuels developments like every couple of weeks, right? So um, to the extent I, I think that where international courts will struggle is their ability to really constrain the activities of a handful of fossil fuels companies around the world and a handful of governments who enable them. And so I, I don't know how helpful international or international courts are going to be to us because that's the problem. All right, that's a good segue <laughs> to Melga. So I'll start with a positive on that first. So uh, European Court of Human Rights, the European Court of Justice, Inter-American Court of Human Rights, Inter-American Commission of Human Rights do have impact. Um, although studies on the Inter-American Court show the more complex its orders are, the more organs of state that we have in the legislature, judiciary, executive, the more challenges there are with the implementation. But those regional courts have always had tremendous effects because of you know the, most countries entering their judgments as as law, uh, and so I think if the European Court of Human Rights does come with a decision, uh, this is, but what it needs is enough European countries to go in ahead, and then it brings up the laggards, and we saw that with Section Three Productive Rights over over twenty years. So. In fact, that, Ger that German decision, I think, is, is really key. Uh, and it may mean the European Court is willing to actually bring uh, the laggards uh, up and, and come up with something that can then be used uh, in the inter-American system similar. I think the Human Rights Committee have, it does have impact in a number of countries which are not part of regional systems. And, and you know, South Korea, for example, has a the Human Rights Committee. Australia at times has it too, but other cases. <laughs> Um, so it's like it really, really varies um, on, on, on the international bodies. I mean, ICJ advisory opinions had some impact in some cases, but spectacularly little in, say, the, 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 the wall case uh, dealing with occupied uh, Palestine. Um, so, and this is, that's going to take time. But I think politically already, the fact that it's going to be advisory opinions. The other major problem is that some of the major countries like Emitters like US, Australia, China, not very much a part of the international system. I think if things come in the WTO, uh, it, it could be very useful. And if investment arbitration tribunals um, push back on investors suing for suing uh, states for implementing climate change policy, which could have a trickle down effect at, at, at the national level. So investment arbitration panels are not going to let you challenge, um, for example, you know, cuts in subsidies or carbon taxes or whatever, that may empower domestic courts uh, as well. So I think it'd be really interesting to have this um, uh, in, in that space. Um, but I just I just left for reasons of you know, brevity, the international side. I think that can have, can have some impacts, um, but also because 
the decisions are highly, highly responsive for the human rights community because they're not directly enforceable in most countries. They could put quite a useful precedent uh, and they're being relied on to be relied on in Australia. Um, in relation to um, uh, the Netherlands, so I understand you, there was a decision today that uh, emissions or it, it was nitrogen from road vehicles. Um, so infrastructure projects. Yes. Um, and the government essentially, it was about a calculation method. Oh, sorry. It was about a calculation method whereby the government said that they weren't calculating the effects beyond a 25 kilometer range. Um, and the challenge to that was that, of course, there would still be deposition beyond 25 kilometers. And the Council of State said that the 25 kilometer range was acceptable. <laughs> so, so there you go about, yeah. How responsive like, is one on yeah, um, demanding evidence? But I think it's a really interesting thing is that um, we've seen it in, in human rights litigation in the last 30 years that civil law uh, apex courts have been much more active, more likely to ratify human rights uh, uh, treaties. Uh, the leading countries are all uh, mostly civil, uh, Colombia, Costa Rica, uh, Germany, uh, and so forth, and then partly Canada, which is partly civil. Um, and I think it's you're also seeing uh, higher success rates there. I mean, um, in addition to South Asia, which is a, you know, a common country's history of public litigation. So, um, so, so the litigation terrain is much tougher in, in the common law countries. That includes South Africa, which is only starting to come, come into this space. They have a doctrine of they're very much the deference or deference light uh, 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 space, even though everybody uh, often. So I think one needs to distinguish between civil law and common law countries in terms of what is possible, and one needs to be highly strategic in, 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 in common law spaces. Um, All right, so thank you very much. Excuse me. Thank you very much, Malcolm and Bryn, for a uh, very stimulating uh, sharing and also response to these questions. So may I invite all of you to have a round of applause for both. Before I uh, offer a lot of thanks to a couple of people who are behind this running this event, I also want to briefly mention about the other events that will be taking place uh, this year. So the center is going to host Law and Nature Dialogues. Two dialogues will take place, one in May, uh, 25th of May, and this is going to be around nature markets. My colleague Paul is here. He's leading on that. And then we'll have another dialogue here on the 12th of October that will be around ecocide. Uh, another colleague daily is here in the room, so uh, if you're interested on that, we did not talk about just transitions, but that will be the theme of the conference that the center is going to host on the first and second of November this year. So more information to come on that. Now, in terms of the word of thanks, of course, I would like to thank our dean, uh, not only for coming but also supporting uh, the center and organizing these events. Uh, three excellent volunteers. Uh, Meow Meow is there, Nina sitting at the back, and Pushkar, uh, my colleagues, uh, center. I've not named each one of them, but thank you very much for coming and all this. And of course, all of you in person and online uh, joining this conversation. Uh, as you may have realized, uh, the date of this uh, lecture was picked intentionally to invite my friends to celebrate my appointment. <laughs> <laughs> and that is just a joke. Yeah. <laughs> and I can promise that the subsequent events uh, will not try to achieve that. For <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, everyone, and have a nice evening. And uh, we look uh, to engage with you uh, in, in the coming months. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.